Hola, comadres. Welcome to the 18th episode of Comadreando. I'm your host, Marcy, and I am joined by two amazing guests today, Jasmine and Jennifer. I will let them introduce themselves. Who are you? Hi. Hey, everyone. My name is Jasmine, also known as Jazz. I am a full spectrum doula. I have to think about why I'm here, right? Wh- which version of myself am I talking about today? <laughs> I am a full spectrum doula based out of the Bronx um, in New York City. And um, I support people and meet them where they're at and I affirm them where they're going through their journey. Um, for me, full spectrum means uh, birth, death, abortion, miscarriage, um, and postpartum. Thank you, Jasmine. Jennifer? My name is Jen. Um, I am also a full spectrum doula based in Uptown in New York City. Um, I am queer, first generation, Dominican, and um, yeah, I'm also excited to be here and talk about all things like birth and you know whatever else comes up (laughs) all right de lo mio okay (laughs) we're very excited (laughs) (laughs) so today's topic is doulas and reclaiming birth um so it's one we've talked about before lightly on the show but i feel like it's very important to shine a light on that and um to have birth justice right um i want to promote having more naturalistic births similar to the ones our our parents and ancestors experienced in the past and um returning to our roots right like leaving not leaving out medical intervention but avoiding it yeah avoiding it because i feel like a lot of the disabilities and things that are going on now besides it being made you know genetic sometimes it has to do with the things that happen during the birth you know, and during the pregnancy. So I want us to, you know, kind of return to our roots and focus on that. And with that being said, let's get started. What is your profession? And this one, we can have Jen start with that. Yeah. Um, do you, well, I mean. Like, what do you do besides being a, a doula? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I do lots of things. I'm also uh, an emergency management specialist for like a government agency. Um, and that's how I pay my bills. <laughs> and then I also um, am a virtual assistant um, to someone. And that is also like how I pay for stuff. So for me, doula work is like, um, is a thing that I'm passionate about. Um, and I hope to eventually make like my full-time job, but at the moment it's not. So I do all these like other things too. Awesome. Thank you. Jasmine. Uh, I like how you said this is how I pay my bills because (laughs) like (laughs) that is a very accurate description (laughs) about why we do other things, right? Why it seems like we have our hands in so many different pots, um, which we'll probably touch on. It was just like a challenge in doula work. Um, but the way I pay my bills right now is um, I'm a child care provider. And I so I work part time as a child care provider. I've been doing this for like 10 years on and off when I'm like in between jobs. And so far, it's been the most rewarding work that I've done. Um, and... I also, um, what else? Oh, I'm a student. So I'm working on my bachelor's. So that's how I split my time. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Wait, what are you studying? What is your major in school? It's a mouthful. It is the multi multi (laughs) interdisciplinary studies of uh, Black studies, women's studies, and um, healthcare. So my goals are to become a midwife, a nurse. Um, nursing is still on my path. COVID kind of changed some things for me um, in my relationship with nursing and, and healthcare overall, but I've been working in healthcare also for like 10 years. So like healthcare and childcare have kind of been mm-hmm. where I keep landing and, and find the most joy. Um, and that's part of the reason why I became a doula was to like help in a, in a more holistic way. 
That's awesome. Thank you so much oh. for that. So let's backtrack because I know there's some people that listen to this that don't know what a doula is. So can we give like a definition, like kind of textbookish, and then like you guys can bring other like aspects of it that are not necessarily covered in the textbooks. Have you ever looked it up before, like the definition, Jen? I have, yeah. What, um, what's your favorite definition? <laughs> uh, a, what is it? It's like the original definition of a doula is a slave who supports their master in birth, like some shit like that, you know? What? So it has very like, like racist roots. Oh my God. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> that's, the one I found is similar, which is like one of my favorite ones is like woman who serves or like woman who supports. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I missed this. I missed the racist one. I got like a really, I got like a, <laughs> a really like Greek one. Um, I was like, okay. <laughs> but it was like woman who serves. Yeah. yeah. It's like the, the yeah. textbook that I, definition that I found that is the easiest to remember and resonate with. Okay, so yeah. how but obviously, okay, yeah, I was gonna say, like, if we're talking about like what actually a doula does, because obviously, like, we're not slaves. Um, <laughs> um, what a doula does is that we um support the emotional, physical, and um, spiritual aspects of birth, and so, um we are not medical providers we're more like i like to think of it more as like guides throughout birth or like a coach if that resonates more with you of like um just like a person who is there to help you and support you like throughout the process awesome so i didn't know what a doula was until i worked in a uh, early intervention not early intervention, sorry, an early Head Start program. Uh, I worked up in uh, the Dykeman area and uh, the school where I worked that they had an early Head Start program. And what they were pushing for was everybody in the program was to be certified to become a doula. I left there before I was able to get trained, but basically from my understanding from what the women were exp uh, explaining, they're like, in the Dominican term, like a comadrona, which is like somebody that helps during births and tries to, you know, make the mother's birth more comfortable, if that makes any mm -hmm. sense. I mean, I didn't know that there was other types of doulas. So that, that was a definition that I understood at the time. So I found it very interesting. And I love the fact that, you know, my mom would talk about this lady that we had in our in our campo back in the day mm -hmm. that would help all the women with the births in the in the town right so there was a lady that helped my grandma same lady like helped birth like like help other women give birth to most of the people in the town so this was like a mm -hmm. staple and even when the kids were sick like the the women would bring like newborns to this lady to help you know to diagnose what the issue could be because it could have been colic or whatever the case may be. And then this, she was like the first person that you would see. And if there was something like out of her scope of um, expertise, she would send you to the doctor, you know, mm -hmm. but um, I found that very interesting. And, and I love the fact that, you know, having another woman in there with you instead of it being like really scary and having just like the doctors or, I mean, yeah, you have nurses, but it's not the same, you know, like it's more, I felt like it was more holistic. So that's what like really attracted me to like looking up into the work uh, that you guys do and um, the importance of it. So I have another question for you both. And it's what made you interested in becoming a doula? Cause it's, it's like, that's not something that somebody just thinks about like, Hey, I'm just going to be a doula. So what, <laughs> what was it that, you know, sparked that interest for you? And we could start with Jasmine. So for me, it was um, spending time with my grandmother when I was like, when I was six, my mom was pregnant with twins. And like, obviously I was obsessed with my mom's pregnancy. Um, and I used to hang out with my grandma because my mom was pregnant with twins. And so I would ask my grandmother questions in my broken Spanish and she would explain it to me in her, in her very 
I um her very poetic Gumpasina voice <laughs> and I wouldn't understand what she was talking about. Um and watching like TLC a baby story. So like yeah. I had these three these three things happen to me around the same time. Um for those of you who don't know about TLC a baby story, it was like this national show that was on TLC when it was called the Learning Channel. <laughs> And yes. um, it would uh, document different people's birth experiences. Uh, poor people, rich people, white, black, queer, married, single. Like, it was really inclusive. Um, for 1996, I was saying a lot. And I noticed, like, this this disparity right away. Like, the, the things that these people were experiencing were completely different than what my mom was experiencing from what my mom was telling me she was going through when I would go with her to the doctor's visits and everything else. It was just very different. And I fell in love with water births. I was like, I'm going to have a water birth because I'm sitting here talking about pregnancy with my grandma. And she's telling me that she gave birth. Um, I think that there was nine living children, but like maybe like 11 or 12 births total. And she did these unmedicated and mommy's yeah. talking about epidurals and I'm just like they put a what in your back a whole what a big needle no if mama can do it I can do it because <laughs> like you sound scared and she sounds empowered and I want the empowered experience um I didn't have all that vocabulary at six I just know I wanted no. a war birth <laughs> um and then different things started happening in my life um, that led me back to healthcare. And about four years ago, I went through doula training through Ancient Song um, after a conversation with a couple of people that wow. went to Ancient Song, um, Griselda included, and um, really like learned like this is where I was meant to be. This is where I'm supposed to be. Like the fact That's that awesome. I've I've had this knowing, like this intuitive like powerful knowing that like this is what we're here for we're supposed to do it in community we're supposed to do it surrounded by love like oxytocin doesn't only help you birth but it also is the love hormone so like mm -hmm. there's a reason why all that is produced during during labor and and pregnancy so let's let's do that <laughs> that sounds more empowering yeah and, i love that like just now it's all about for me it's about affirming people's decisions because i'm not here to tell you what is best for you i'm here to affirm whatever decision is that you make because i know that i'm the only one who's been talking about water births and i'm the only one i'm one of the only adult grandchildren who doesn't have children so like their experiences versus what their parents experiences were so different that like they look at me like i'm the odd one out i'm like no it's okay <laughs> yeah that's usually like when you when you rattle the cages and you kind of like go against the grain that's usually the case in families especially yeah. when people are used to doing it a certain yeah. way for a very long time all right Jen your turn <laughs> yeah um yeah it's just it's so funny that you mentioned the baby story Jasmine because I've heard like a few doulas mention that that mm -hmm. that was like the thing like they were like yeah I used to watch this and like fucking love birth yeah um yeah. um I did want to say something before I I go into uh like what got me into doula work yeah, so comadronas are midwives and so and they deliver the babies as doulas in the context of the U.S. Uh, okay. we don't Okay. Yeah, so I'm not out there catching babies. I'm just like supporting. <laughs> yeah, I I, um, I never heard the comadrona term. I've okay. heard um patera. Um, oh, una patera, yeah. So like the way I explain it to my grandmother is like, yo ayudo los pateros. Like that's what yeah, I okay. do. Like I'm I'm their yeah. assistant. I'm like the Got middle it. person. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So wait, is there is there in in like our the context of our culture of Dominican culture, is there something similar to a doula that that we used to have or no? I don't think so. Like a, I don't I, think there's a term. That, yeah, yeah. Not that I can think of. Yeah, I, the the only 
yeah, I think it would just be like the midwife doing it. And then the midwife would have like an assistant, but it would be like a, like a birth assistant helping the midwife. Um, mm. But so, wouldn't they do yeah, the kind of do it in community? So somebody that already gave birth would be there. They wouldn't, I know for a fact, probably they wouldn't yeah. let anybody that hadn't had children be in the birth. Yeah. I don't know what yeah. was the reason well, for that. Yeah. So you bring, so you bring up a good point, right? So it's like, the reason doulas exist in the U.S. is because we've been separated from kind of those like traditions of, of like community, of PR, right? So like, and community, because like when, which, you know, to a certain extent, I'm sure this still happens now is like, you're seeing people give birth all the time. You're kind of around it all the time and you're talking about it. So there's no need to, to like, to have this like outside person to help you prepare for the birth because it's kind of like you've been preparing it for your whole life and then also like you have like you have like a comadrona that you go to that kind of like explains everything to you and you have people in your family that are like supporting you and stuff like that versus like here it's like um we rely heavily on like the medical system and stuff and like we're just like, again, like Jasmine said, separated from community. So it's like, it's like, like that, like detachment from the roots makes it so that we have to exist. <laughs> um, and um, so, yeah, so that's kind of like the deal. Okay. So, yeah. What made you interested in becoming a doula though? <laughs> that was a question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so um for me it was like kind of less obvious. Um I wasn't really around like, you know, babies that much or pregnant people or anything. Um but once I like I knew I was like into public health and like I went through a phase where I was like I'm going to be an OBGYN. Um and then you know, got to college and I was like no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Too much work. Yeah. Um, but I was in the Peace Corps um, and I was in Guatemala and I was a maternal and child health volunteer. And so there I was like working with a lot of like the midwives in the community, a lot of um, a lot of just like people who are pregnant, people with young kids. And that's really kind of like where the interest started, where um i uh yeah i just like liked it and i was like oh uh how can i keep doing this and then there were a few volunteers that had gone on to become doulas and do birth work and so that's kind of like what my introduction was and then i did my first training with mama glow and um during like that training that's kind of where i was like where I felt like it was like, a, okay, like I'm meant to do this. I'm meant to be here. Um, because I, uh, before that I was just like kind of nervous to take the plunge, you know, because it's like, I was intimidated by the idea of like having to like be in business for myself and like finding clients and like all this stuff. Like I couldn't like conceptualize like what all of that would look like. Mm -hmm. And so then like, I was like, I'm just going to like take the training and see. And then like, there's mama glow has like a huge kind of like spiritual aspect to her trainings. And like during one of the like meditations that we were doing, I felt like, um, I, I felt like, uh, like I, I, I heard like, uh, like, just like a voice tell me, like, you know, like you're meant to do this. And I felt like the presence of like a, like a great, like a higher being, like great grandmother type oh my God. thing, you know? Um, and I have no idea, like if there was like a person in my family who has like been like a comadrona or something, you know, but I've asked around, nobody can tell me, but I felt yeah. it like very clearly that that was like, who That's was there amazing. with me in the room. Um, and so that's kind of, and even like, as I'm talking about it now, like I kind of feel like that same, like kind of surge of energy. Yay. Um, so that's, yeah. So for me, it's like, like, it feels like the work that I'm supposed to be doing and, um, and I feel like really passionate about it and, you know, I 
honored that people let me be there like when their babies are being born and so yeah. i'll just keep doing it until like until i can anymore <laughs> it's a very important time in your life and like you know it's like just the the whole idea of you know you're you're part of this big thing because people want to like diminish birth but birth is like you're bringing another being into this world yeah. It's it's like mm-hmm. something so huge and people like wanna um como te digo they wanna like downplay it like it's nothing which mm-hmm. is really crazy for me. Um ladies uh, just... next question. What are your goals when helping during a birth? You wanna go first? Uh, yeah, sure. Um so my goals are if we're talking about like pre birth Um, When I'm working with people, my goals are that people feel informed, you know, so that they have like all the information about like what their options are, um, that they know if they're, you know, giving birth in a hospital, that uh, they know how to navigate like conversations with different providers. Um, And it's really like the goal is that people have a plan that or an idea of like what they want and um and so then the goal at the birth is like that we can stay as close to the plan as possible and even if like the plan goes sideways because a lot of the times it does is that people feel like supported throughout the process and that they're like an active part of the birth versus like birth happening to them which Mm -hmm. um is easier said than done um but that is like you know ideally like what would happen (laughs) yeah awesome all right and what about you jasmine when i show up for a client um what i want for them is to feel like they were in they were in tandem in planning in their experience that they didn't feel like something they they felt like birth was an experience and not something that happened to them but something that they were involved in right so that me for me that means providing them information um informing them answering questions for them um providing like a, a different perspective on certain things so that means like Did you know that this was optional? Did you know that induction is optional? Mm -hmm. That, and that there's like passive measures or the passive measures of what, um, of what induction looks like for different providers. Like you don't have to do anything. Mm. And like, because of where I come from in healthcare um, and the way that I wanna show, serve my community, I remind my clients that healthcare is a business and they are the consumer. And if they don't like the service that they're receiving, it is their right and their authority to question it and get different services. Yes. So that's like one of, and like, that's my role in healthcare too. Like I, when I was doing case management, I was like, if you don't like your doctor, you can change. It does not affect my, like, I don't feel differently about you. If you, (laughs) if you go to a different hospital. Um, and, um, so to provide information, um, to have my clients feel affirmed and seen during their experience and supported. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And that's such a good point. It's like, it's like fire your doctor. Like so many doctors need, need to get fired. Reported, fired. Yeah. Like. (laughs) Yeah. Shut and, down. and also, the, yeah, like the thing that drives me nuts is like when I work with people and they have like, you know, they have these like amazing visions for their birth, right? You know, they're like, I want it unmedicated and like no interventions and like all this stuff. And then their doctor has like one of the highest C-section rates like in the city, you know? Oh so God, yeah. it's like, it's really important that your birth team supports like what your vision is for your birth. Because like, if you go in there and you share like with your doctor, 
like everything that you want or like what you're planning for and then their reaction is like oh like we'll see or like no you really can't do that because or they won't even say why they'll just be like no you can't do that then you're already setting yourself up for failure because like this person is already not on board with like what you're trying to do and then it just like then the birth becomes about like fighting this person and like and it just like makes everything more difficult it's you know? not empowering because you're fighting yeah and like you don't yeah. realize that you have the autonomy to say i don't have to fight with you i can go somewhere yeah. else and like that goes for your doula that goes for your the nurses that are servicing you that goes for the doctors that are servicing you the med group the hospital like you have authority in this experience because you're paying for it whether you're on medicaid whether you are a commercial um health like health insurance recipient like through your employer you pay for that you are you are in, you are empowering these people to make decisions for you and they don't affirm or align with your beliefs and you and you keep going i don't like please ask these questions if this is important to you ask your provider is it important to them because it will come out before you give birth and you will feel much more empowered during your experience of birth um if you know this ahead of time that's very important. Um, I like I shared my birth story before when um, I had on the episode with Felicia, and um, you know they they ended up inducing me because I was uh, having like really high blood pressure at the time, but there was no mm-hmm. other options. Like they didn't offer me like they weren't like, hey, if you do this, it can reduce your blood pressure, or you know if you do this, you can avoid you know eventually going into having a c having a c section, which was like super traumatic for. Not for me necessarily, because it was a very comfortable experience based on my, my, you know, what I went through. I was at a very good hospital. But at the end of the day, like when Aiden was born, his face was like all smushed up. You know what I'm saying? Like, Mm -hmm. and I feel like had I had somebody that was experienced in birth there to help advocate for me, not only that, but then like, you know, to use all those um, techniques and tools that you ladies use um, during births, it would have probably been a different story. So I feel like I love that the the fact that you guys are doing the work to empower women, especially during birth. And that it that, and I love what you said that um, it shouldn't be something that happens to you. You know, it should be something that you are a part of that you are actually having input and you feel like you're, you're being empowered in that way, which is awesome. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about something that I saw online. Um, There was like a viral story about a woman that paid like $6,000, I believe, for a a postpartum doula. And people were going ham. They were like, oh, my God, how can you spend all this money? Blah, 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 blah. Um, So I wanted to know what you guys thought about that. And then, like, why do you think so much pushback on getting somebody to help you after you give birth? Is Like, why, why people are so shocked, you know? Yeah. Whoever wants misery, to go first. Uh, Jasmine, Jasmine's like, uh, yeah. like but like yeah. misery no, misery loves I, company. Like yeah. misery loves company. Like that is one of the most frustrating experiences sometimes is dealing with other family members of clients who want the person that is now pregnant to have the same experiences that they had. Um and I think that there's too much conversation regarding like the struggles of motherhood that are being like this is just a part of motherhood like Mm -hmm, you just have to mm -hmm. you just have to have this negative experience yeah I was sleepless yeah my mother didn't come oh your mother can't come oh that sucks for you you got to do it Mm -hmm. anyway and it's just like no the reason why I'm a doula I was talking to one of my doula friends yesterday the reason why I'm a doula the reason why I'm a child care provider is because everyone deserves someone who gives as many fucks as I give like everybody deserves that yeah and until I can afford my own Jasmine I'm not having children <laughs> like yeah and I I'm proud of the doula who knew their worth I'm proud of the family who was able to afford them 
I am proud of them for the way that they articulated because I did read like the response, the one response that mm-hmm. the the mom gave back is like it's three nights a week and I get to show up as a better version of myself because of my yeah, doulas. Yeah. Like who who doesn't want like I'm the eldest. I know Marcy, you're the eldest. Like we're parentified. We're parentified because our parents were tired. Mm-hmm. And like this parent is now rested, which means that their firstborn can be a child. Yes. Oh, I felt that. Girl, yeah. I felt that in my womb. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, yes. like the, yeah. It's it's yeah. it's it's so it's so simple. Like to me, the pushback, the, the what 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 social media was saying because we're not even going to call them community. Like they're just miserable people who don't realize that we don't have to live in misery anymore. Mm-hmm. girl yeah no you're right and it's like if you have the money because also it's like we see the six thousand dollar price tag right but we don't know how many hours this doula put in we don't know how long the contract was for yes. we don't know if it included like birth support before you know there's like all these different things if like we don't know if there was classes in there like we don't know like what else was in this bill right? lactation so, like, support like yeah yeah, so it's, like, to just base it off of, like, the price alone and, like, minimizing it to be, like, oh, you're spending all this money to have someone, like, watch your kid, you know, is is unfair. And you're you're so right that it's, like, so much of it is, like, it, it, I see this a lot with, um, with birth, too, like, people just only sharing their terrible stories of birth to people. And it's, like, people just carrying around all this trauma yes. around, like this unresolved trauma of like the birth that went badly or like the postpartum that went badly. And then they're putting that onto other people. And so then it's like, it's like they haven't worked through that. So then they see things like that where someone is like, has a positive birth experience or they have like the resources to have support during postpartum and they just like lose their shit. And they're like, what do you mean? You're like paying for all this money. Like, like you said, like, If I had to do this all by myself, like, you could do this all by yourself. And, like, that's not the point. Like, uh, you probably can do it by yourself. But if you can have, like, more help and not struggle, why not do that? You know? Like, why are you signing up for the struggle, like, if you don't have to? And, again, like, postpartum doula support exists because, like, we don't have the same community that we used to. Because before, like, you know, if we're talking about Dominicans, right, we have the practice of cuarentena. And in Mm -hmm. cuarentena, like, we have all the people in the family come and take care of the pregnant person, and they don't have to lift a finger. It's just, like, they're literally just there taking care of the baby. Like, literally, their feet should not touch the ground like all this stuff and like everyone else is cooking, cleaning, feeding them, doing all that stuff. Yes. But like we're in New York city. Nobody can do that really. Like we don't really have the luxury of that. So that's where like postpartum doulas come in, you know? And so like, all like, yeah, if you can afford it, like highly recommend a postpartum doula, you know, and charge people what they're worth, because this is like how we pay our bills, you know, like we're people too, we got other people that we have to support, we have other bills that we have to pay. So like, whatever we charge, it's for a reason. It's not like we're just like, okay, I'm gonna charge you $6,000, you know, and I'm gonna wipe my ass with this hundred dollar bill. No, like <laughs> that's not what it is. <laughs> like that six thousand dollars. I hope that like that because a lot of the work that I do is also like community based. So like I have mm-hmm. my base rate, but then I also have like clients who cannot afford, who really want yeah. and need, and like are not out here buying yes silky strollers. But mm-hmm. um, but saying that they can't afford a doula, yeah. like they are, they're they have no shola, they have no car seat, and they really need the mm-hmm. support. Um, so like in order for me to be able to service that person or that family, mm-hmm. I need to be able to charge my market rate clients as well. Like if you have yeah. the resources, use yes. that resource. And there's so many doulas that I know that are like me who are just like pay what you can. But make sure that it's equitable, right? Like it can't like yeah. that's there's there's um there's a reel that I saw. <laughs> it was like start a fight with one sentence and it's like um you <laughs> it's like a lot more people are worried about maternity shoes, baby showers, gender reveals instead of informing themselves on birth. Yeah. 
Yes. And that's um, real. I was like, I want to post this, but I don't want to have the conversation. Like, I don't want to argue the point. Like, yeah. listen, just You're drop like, the bomb. The you throw the bomb. Like, you know, you take, you take the ring out of the grenade, throw it in there, and walk away. And whatever conversation happens, happens. Yeah, it is what it is, yeah. man. It's like, yeah, and you know, we're not we're not here to money shame because like money has a whole bunch of emotions wrapped up into it, but it's also like. You know, like, I find that when people, like, want to prioritize, like, like, people have their priorities, right? And so, like, if they, if their priority is, like, having a doula, then, like, they're going to find the money for it, you know? And so, it's, like, there, a lot of doulas also, like, work on sliding scale. A lot of them take, like, pro bono clients um, and just, like, work at, like, you know, discounted rates and things like that there's even like grants out there now so it's like if it's something that you really want like i don't think that you should just assume that that's going to be like the price tag that you have to pay and it's also like being honest about like what you can afford you know because like sometimes um like as the people who's providing the service it's frustrating when like we have someone who asks like for sliding scale and then like you get to their house and they live like in a penthouse on the Upper East Side, you know? Mm. So like, it's, we also have to be like considerate too, you know, and like be honest with like what we can afford and like not, not like just asking for a discount because you can ask for a discount, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I felt, I felt very strongly about that. Cause I think about it. If I, like if, if I could pay somebody $6,000 to help me take the baby and just worry about feeding the baby or pumping or whatever, it's it, it, like, I'll pay for it. Cause like the hospital I went to, the reason why I picked Hackensack University Medical Center, like, you know, all these hospitals around here, honestly, like I didn't want to give birth at Island Pavilion. And I am going to say the name of the hospital because they have a <laughs> terrible rate of births and the way that they treat the yeah. mothers that are there is really gross. So yeah. I didn't want to give birth at one of these hospitals up here. I decided to go over there. I had really expensive insurance because I was working private and I took advantage of that. And you know what I'm saying? Like the services at the hospital were so good that I didn't have to, the nurses would come and take the baby. They would only bring him in to feed. And if think about it, if you don't have to actually get up, the baby's already awake and you have somebody bring them to you, either, you know, you pumped already and, and, and they put, or they put them on your breast while you're still sleeping and you don't have to actually wake up, I would pay for that. Like the, the reason why mothers are so stressed out is that, you know, they, a lot of them have to do it alone and you don't have to do it alone. You do not have to struggle. I love that Jasmine said that you do not have to struggle just because our parents didn't have those resources or the luxury, you know, of doing these things doesn't mean that we have to also, ha you know, go through the same thing, you know, just because we, as people struggle, doesn't mean that we have to like, you know, continue the cycle of the struggle. You know what I'm saying? Th that, that was one of the things that really shocked me, but I mean, I feel like the $6,000 is worth it. And who knows exactly what um, John said, who knows how long the contract was for. We don't know what was included in the contract. It wasn't just postpartum work um i kind of want to steer the conversation let's leave that at that but like i want to steer the conversation like are you trained to recognize signs of postpartum depression in the people that give birth that you take care of after birth um loosely like there are certain things that um I, I, whenever I have suspected that someone has had like postpartum depression or like some sort of postpartum mood mm -hmm. disorder, I have been right. Oh, um, wow. Okay. Yeah. So enough to like tell people to refer them to like someone else. Yeah. And I do like to talk about that, about like some things to look out for mm -hmm. and like, you know, some things that may not, that aren't like normal. I love that. Cause I feel like 
me and Philly, when we were sharing our stories, we went through postpartum, but I feel like if we would have had somebody there that not necessarily that you guys are not necessarily trained in it, but like somebody that has been around people that have given birth and like, they know like certain like little red flags that are happening, you know, it's easier to avoid like getting to that really, really dark place. Cause like, yeah, you go through it, but if you have somebody there that's supporting you, it's easier to kind of avoid or like re redirect that in a way. I don't know if, if that's accurate. I think one of the other yeah. things, oh, sorry, is like the one of the best things about I think having a doula, is having an outside person to come in is like during that relationship, during those prenatal visits, one of the things that we're doing is getting to know each other and understanding like what's normal, what isn't for you. So like there's so many people who discredit like the prenatal visits. They're like, well, I want to focus on postpartum. It's like if I don't know you. And I don't know that you are mm -hmm. already an anxious person or already like you have depressive symptoms. Like for me, when I'm depressed, I sleep a lot, but like, and most people do. Right. Um, but you're also during postpartum, like, and you're also, we're just pregnant. Like, so you should be resting, but is this a normal amount of rest for you? And like, you have to develop that relationship mm -hmm. with your client and understand who they are just a little bit more so that we can so that we can ad adequate, adequately refer services and adequately like recommend solutions and like think of, like know who you are because with me like I do like one of my last postpartum visits is around the two week mark and um so oxytocin like all your hormones mm -hmm. are are leveling and which is sometimes what happens and leads to postpartum um the, like mental health disorders um and you don't you haven't seen your doctor who literally does the screening at six weeks until you're mm. six like so that's like there's like a four-week gap or sometimes even longer where you have it or six-week gap where you haven't seen the doctor and been evaluated for yourself so for them to know like to pick these things up earlier because so much is happening in those in those first mm -hmm. 40 days that like we don't know if we don't know you and you don't know that this is important for for us to know then how can we ad adequately support you that's amazing thank you so much um so what other kind of situations are you are you trained for cuz I, I like i feel like the doulas that i met at the at the program like one of them would use like a rebozo to like help turn the baby during the birth. Like we also, oh, I did go to um, get trained for prenatal massage. So I learned like all of that, which was awesome. And I was like able to teach the moms <clears throat> that I was working with in the early Head Start program, which was like birth to three. So I was able to teach them how to like massage their child, like for colleagues to help them relax to get them ready for bed all these things so it was like really beautiful because you were teaching them how to connect with their child in a more intimate way besides just breastfeeding because a lot of the moms i mean at least for me when i gave birth because i had mommy said it had something to do with the the epi, not the epidural it had something to do with the anesthesia for the for the c-section i didn't produce a lot of milk I don't know if that there is actually a correlation in that. I would like to like do more research about it. But, um, you know, <clears throat> for moms like me that didn't get to, like Aiden didn't breastfeed for a long time because I wasn't producing enough milk, like having that, that, that infant massage piece, you know, was essential in building that bond with him when he was a baby. So like, I wanted to know like, what other situations are you trained for? that um that's part of the training or, or things that you have looked up and, and kind of um researched on your own um a lot of the additional things that i know have come through practice um or talking to other doulas who are like massage certified or who um who know like like i I'm a fan of acupressure and acupuncture. So like I've learned certain different like pressure points to help support um, the parent during birth. Um, uh, 
I do use like rebozos, but I'm not trained like I'm not like traditionally trained in how to use mm-hmm. them. Uh, I use aromatherapy again. That's more intuitive um, mm-hmm. and not not like traditionally trained. Uh, I don't know if there's anything that like I can't think of anything right now. That I'm like, oh yes, I do that because I do so much already that yeah. like it's 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 kind of like what I love about like the doula service is that it's it's kind of catered to you. It's kind of like what you need. If you need like aromatherapy, I have that. If you need a tens machine, I have that. If you want a rebozo, I can show you how you can use it at home with your partner. I can show you how you can use it with a parent um or a grandparent like I could or yourself like I have these like little tips and tricks that I can share with you so that you can feel empowered during your experience so it doesn't feel like something's happening to you um yeah Uh, yeah, I would I would say the well, same thing as as Jasmine. I am like trained in lactation too, so I support a lot of folks like with lactation. Um, I uh, let's see what else. Um, yeah, you just like kind of pick up like <laughs> a bunch of stuff, you know, because there are some people who are like more like like more touch. So it's like yeah, like you kind of learn like these different little massages or like different comfort measures or yeah, like the acupressure points and stuff like that. Um, I personally don't use the reboso because I, um, I'm not indigenous. It's not part of like, it's not, you have to really like know what you're doing with the reboso. Otherwise you can like cause more harm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's not something that I put in my doula bag. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, basically just like, kind of like whatever, whatever people need. I tend to do a lot of like, I'm big on like food. So I make like lots of teas, lots of broths, nice. um, things like that. Yeah. Wait, so you guys have, like, a doula bag, like, a doctor's bag? Like, what do you put in your doula bag? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, what does it look like? What do you put in there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so in my doula bag, I have, like, um, it depends on, like, the birth, too, or, like, the hospital um, that I'm going to. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, like, if it's, a, if it's a home birth. But I have, like, you know, um, I do have, like, a birth ball that, like... I take sometimes I also have like some essential oils some like different types of like like things for people to hold um uh what else um lots of snacks for myself <laughs> um honey sticks like coconut water I actually don't have chapstick in there I usually tell them to bring the chapstick but I should have it in there it's for you um, <laughs> Oh, for myself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chapstick for myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sugar. What do you have in your bag, Jasmine? I have, um, I, I'm happy you brought up the whole rebozo thing because like, I don't use it to spin babies. I use it for like the, the pressure points on the, on the hip. So on I the like, back, yeah. yeah. So like to, to, for, for pain relief, I don't use it for spinning babies because I'm not trained in that. Um, but I do have a rebozo, um, or it's just like a, a nice little scarf. Um, I have these like massage rollers that I've gotten. Um, I have like a lot of pain management stuff because that's what mm. seems to be the bigger concern is like, I don't want to, don't want to be in pain. So to combat that, I, essential oils, um, the massage roller, I actually have a like a roller that I've that I've I make for myself that has been super for like pain um and discomfort during my my cycle. So it's the same muscles that are in pain when you're in labor. So mm. depending on the client and the level of comfort that I have with the client, I'll share the one that I have or I'll make one for them. Um I have the birth partner, the book in my um 
birthing bag because a lot of partners tend to like it or like if I forget something or if I just want to like double check something Mm -hmm. I like to keep that as a reference I have a birth ball and a pump (laughs) Um, uh, a, a charger and lots of snacks for me (laughs) <laughs> wait so wait i want to i want to know like more about like what what have been some of your most memorable births like it could be a positive or not so positive situation or like your first birth because i know that's like popping your cherry your, your doula cherry so uh i don't know who has to go first <laughs> I I cried um, I cried twice in one week um for a good reason and a bad reason. Oh no, okay. <laughs> I cry at every birth. I don't. I don't. I like I'm really good at like disconnecting. Like I walk in yeah. and I walk out. So yeah. like the first so it took me a while to get my first client cuz nobody wants a doula to be their first like yeah. nobody wants that. So I ended up having oh, to be the first birth. Yeah, avoided? yeah, they get scared. They think that oh, we're okay, yeah. they think that we're just practicing on them, but they don't realize that doctors <laughs> are actually practicing on them. Um, That's such a good point. Yeah, <laughs> like the, I've, the, I've never like, like connected the medicine. two. Like, how do you know? Yeah, so especially in July when the new residents start. You could be the oh first god. baby that your doctor catches, but nobody says. But nobody, nobody questions the resident. No. Oh my god! No, <laughs> they don't. They don't say. Oh, when you have four different hands inside doing a measure, uh, measure of the cervix, you don't question that. But you don't want me to be your first client. Like you don't want me to. Be, you don't want to be my first client. I'm so awesome. No, it's it's, it's okay, y'all. We're not salty at all. <laughs> no, not anymore because we we've been there. <laughs> <laughs> So it took me a while to start, like, start getting clients. Um, and I ended up, like, in overdrive. And I had four births in, like, three weeks. Um, That's bananas. Yeah. It, it was. And then I went on a hiatus. <laughs> I went on a much needed rest. Um, <laughs> but the birth that made me cry was this parent who really needed support they were in a shelter they were in an issue of like emotional abuse um they had a toddler and they were like 38 weeks pregnant um and they were still nursing their toddler so i meet them and they share so much with me right i met them on on sunday and we were texting and like getting to know each other and trying to coordinate an official like introduction because I don't want to show up at your birth and that's the first time you're meeting me. That's not what I'm here for. I'm like, hi. <laughs> I'm here to see your vagina. <laughs> and to touch you intimately with permission, please. Um I have done that before. It's, it's it is slightly awkward, yeah. It's it's unsettling just a little bit. Like I want yeah. I, I I don't feel like you're getting a full like experience with me and I don't want you to have a discounted experience um so and they were so preoccupied about how they were going to finance this my services and I was just like well we'll work that out like that's fine I appreciate the fact that you want me to you want to pay me but you really need the support so we can we can work that out right now let's figure out what's important to you about your birth and let's let's coordinate um and come up with like a really workable plan because you are literally like you're dilating you're active you're in passive labor you are actively dilating um so their their toddler i think was like three years old and um so their their that birth experience was super fresh so my client shared that they didn't want to have an episiotomy, which is when they open, they surgically, they take scissors and they cut you. Um, from Depends on the doctor and depends on how aggressive oh they God. are, but they cut you oh. sometimes from your vagina to your, uh, to your anus. Like, it can be a deep cut. Oh my God. Um, 
and it's really uncomfortable. So this was my first time experiencing a episiotomy, and this is now like my third client. Um, so I've had like I have a little experience. I kind of know what to expect. The hospital was, you know, a renowned hospital um, in Manhattan, and they had a birth ball. When so so she shared with me that she didn't want an episiotomy. She shared with me that she didn't want an epidural. She shared with me how she didn't want Pitocin because all these things really impacted her experience in her previous birth. Um, negatively experience, um, impacted. I met this person. I probably logged 10 hours with this person and I learned this much from them, right? I learned that they weren't sure if they wanted to circumcise their son. I learned that they wanted to nurse. They wanted to continue to, ta- they wanted to tandem nurse. They wanted to nurse the toddler and the newborn. Um, mm. All these things that were super important for them. And I was like, they wanted delayed cord clamping, um, which is where you just wait a couple of minutes until the umbilical cord stops pulsing um, to before you cut it. This, the, the physician who was there at the birth was the same physician who was there at the first birth. In the nine months that they were going to prenatals with this doctor, they never expressed any of their concerns. So I walked in. So they didn't want a membrane sweep. They got it anyway. The first birth, it it felt really like, sorry, I live in the hood, (laughs) y'all. They uh, they didn't want like all these negative, like influences again, because they 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 weren't helpful for them. And I get to the birth. So, so, so that was Sunday. Monday, she goes in for a membrane sweep. The same thing that she told me she didn't want. But she did it anyway. And I was just like, okay, let's go. Like, and immediately labor starts. Um, a memory sweep is like an aggressive pap smear with someone's hand. They manually scrape the cervix to oh thin it out and... Trying to trying to get the contractions going. Oh my god. Um, so they had the memory sweep and immediately started having contractions. Um, dropped off their toddler at the person who's going to take care of the toddler and went to the hospital. I get to the hospital, and so she's texting me, and I'm like, okay, I'm I'm wrapping up where I need to be. I'll be there as soon as I can. Um. I get to the hospital, so I'm driving, and I get a text message, and she's like, they broke my waters. Again, something that is, like, an act of induction. And I said, did you want them to? And she said, I didn't know I had a choice. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll, like, I'm literally pulling up whatever street I was on, like, dropped off my car at the lot, and ran into the hospital. Um, I get there and she is sh- alone, shivering in pain because she's on Pitocin and doesn't want the epidural because she wants to prove that she's strong enough to handle these contractions. She goes, and I'm like, okay, like we can lower the Pitocin and we can, um, get the epidural going. Like, these are options for you. There's a birth ball in the room, but they're on Pitocin, and they are therefore kind of confined to their bed, and they're also alone. So how can she get on the birth ball? Right? Mm. So I get there maybe around 3 o'clock. I think she got there closer to 12. Um, She gave birth before 7 o'clock. And some of the things that happened were really, like, aggressive from my perspective. All the things that happened were really aggressive from my perspective. (laughs) Except this one thing that I wish doctors talked about. Um, Is during prenatals and, like, ways that you can, like, improve birth. So I remember the nurse came in, the doctor came in, the nurse came in around, like, maybe like 6 30 and she he goes we're about seven centimeters dilated we're gonna have this baby before seven o'clock and I looked at the doctor and I was just like before seven it's like 6 30 like 
we still got some ways to go. We still have three more centimeters to go. And she's in, she's, she's in pain. She's like, visibly she's in pain, even though she has the epidural. So when you're in pain, your cortisol levels go up. You're, uh, you're like, you're tight. You're not relaxed. So even though her body is, which is probably why she was shivering and in so much pain because her body was working against the Pitocin, like her, her natural hormones were working against this artificial hormone. So, Mm -hmm. right. And I looked and I said, like, that's really quick. Like, why are you so certain? And the nurse kind of looks at me and just nods. And I'm like, oh, no. I was like, no. So I feel like he had her push when she was, like, around nine centimeters. And, you know, the one thing that he did that I enjoyed is that he had mineral oil nearby, and he had the nurse pouring mineral water into the the vaginal opening, and he was massaging in this way. For those of you who will watch the video, it's like this cross action where you release the muscles between in the perineum. I know I never feel comfortable in the way I say that word, but that space between the vaginal, the space between the the ghetto term for that is the gooch. (laughs) It's the gooch. Massages the gooch, the muscles between the, the vagina and the anus to relax and work for labor. So I'm like, okay. And he's actively like massaging. And I'm like, I've never seen like, this is my third birth. And this is the first time I'm seeing this. Look at you. You're doing something amazing. (laughs) <laughs> and then here comes the scissors and because she never spoke to the doctor in her nine months of prenatal visits with the doctor I didn't feel like I had the authority to remind mm-hmm. him that she didn't want that so I feel like I failed my client because she ended up with an epidural I mean a, a episiotomy which in recovery during her postpartum was one of the most challenging things That's she went tough, through man. Um, because now this is like scar, like this is, you're cutting scar tissue. So when you cut scar tissue, the healing process is twice as, as long because it takes longer for those vessels to grow back or reconnect. Um, so I went home really sad because I didn't feel like I did a good job in supporting my client and all the things that she told me she didn't want, she ended up experiencing. Um, and then two days later, I had a client give birth at the Brooklyn Birthing Center. And there was a moment where she was pushing, I'll make it really short. <laughs> there was a moment where she was pushing and she was surrounded by nine family members because there is no limit at the Brooklyn Birthing Center at that time. Yeah. They may have changed it because of COVID and because of this family. <laughs> but there were nine <laughs> members of, of the family there in support and watching this their their youngest sister youngest daughter niece like give birth and again met her on tuesday she gave birth on wednesday or thursday and so really didn't get like to fully know her but despite the fact that she had nine family members she felt like she really needed the support of a doula Mm -hmm. and there was a pivotal moment where um the the midwife the the midwife assistant and myself looked at looked at the client and she was like I can't do this and I was like the three of us in unison was just like yes you can and then like the baby was born and like I was emotional it was like I felt all the love like (laughs) like I felt all the love like I got all the oxytocin I was like okay (laughs) <laughs> and then there, there was like little things that's awesome like there was like little things of of like during the birth where she like she ended up having meconium stained fluid um which is where like the baby passes its first bowel in the waters inside yeah um or in the amniotic sac so um and that was the one thing that she told me she was afraid of she was like i don't want to have to ha- be transferred to a hospital or if something bad happens to my baby if there's meconium Um, so I was able to look at the midwife and for direction and say, what does this mean? What are our options? And she's like, you have an hour, like, and she gave birth within the hour, like naturally. 
So. Oh my God, thank God. Yeah, it was, it was a great week. <laughs> <laughs> That's intense. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say, yeah, I mean, like, how do I even follow that? Um, but I, <laughs> <laughs> but I guess I'll, I'll say like one of my favorite births that I've been to, it was just like, it was, so it was one of my like earlier ones and the person, my client, she gave birth at Brooklyn Methodist and, um, it was, it was just like, it was just like very chill, you know, it was yeah. like, I had been to like other, um, like at that point I had been to, to a few births where like, um, where, yeah, it was like my first, like, like, uh, no intervention birth at a hospital. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, like she just did amazing. Like, I don't even know how to explain it. It was just like, you know, like, like, like everything that she wanted, she got the providers were like super nice. And like, you know, it was just like everything like went well, the baby was born and like, you know, we all cried after and we're like, well, this is great. <laughs> Aww, this is so sweet. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that, um, so yeah, so, you know, like it's possible. Yeah. To, to have that. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to share with the listeners that, um, Jennifer and I were in the vagina monologue together <laughs> And she yeah. actually had yeah. the very last monologue, which is about birth. So yeah. I don't know if people have actually seen the vagina monologues, but most of the stories are about like trauma and women's experiences with their vaginas. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of most of the the majority of the monologues are negative. And then the last two were like positive experiences. And she yeah. closes out the show talking about this birth and it was like so beautiful and when um jennifer walks out she's dressed all in white <laughs> and she's wearing a head wrap and it was just like the way that she delivered it was just so like on brand for her like the person that she is <laughs> and who she is as a doula it was just so dope but ladies yeah. oh okay so some tips that i gathered from what you guys were saying were make sure you have a birth plan yeah uh, make mm -hmm. sure your doctor sticks to the birth plan. Communicate that birth plan with your doctor and your doula and your midwife if you have one. Yeah. Um, make sure that you do your research about the, the doctor that you're going to see before you give birth to make sure that they're, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what is it? The C-section rate is not like the highest. Yeah. And um, anything else that we should add in there for the listeners? You're a consumer of the care that you receive. So if you don't like the care that you're receiving, find new care. Dump them. <laughs> yeah. 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 Couldn't have said it better myself. Also, it's not so much um, that the doctor sticks to the plan, but that you are consenting to it. Yes. So find yourself a provider that asks for your consent for everything. Because no, you shouldn't be told what to do. They shouldn't say like, I'm going to do a memory suit. I'm gonna give you an epidural or I'm gonna Or we're going do to a do this check. now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like it should always be a question and you can always say no. It's never like uh they phrase it as like a thing that they're going to do, but you can always say no. No is a full sentence. Yes. Thank you can you. also I defer. It. it can be not right now. Like, mm, okay. yeah. yeah, like you, this is about you and your experience, not about what they want for you. It's about what you want for yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's just so much, just hire either Jasmine or myself so that we can <laughs> yes. talk and do this. Listen, I'm putting there's all no way your, we can cover it. <laughs> your contact information is definitely going in the show notes. Um, you know, you know why I, want, I picked you too? Cause I know other doulas, but you are, afro latinas you are dominican you are from the heights <laughs> and the bronx and it's like you know we need to empower our own people and i feel like if i have this platform and i have you know this this way to get our voices out i'm going to put my people on and that's 
on period, right? So, <laughs> and we're going to end the show with that. Uh, follow me at Comadreando Pod on IG and Jasmine. Do you want to give your, your doula one or the or your business or all of them? I'm trying to merge you? them right now. Right now, okay. it's just Jasmine Heels. Um, J-A-Z-M-I-N-H-E-A-L-S. Um, and my website is withjazz.com. Awesome. And you can follow Jennifer at... Uh, Gem of a doula, J-E-M of a doula, D-O-U-L-A, on Instagram. And um, you can also, my website is unitedinbirth.com. I love it that you guys have websites. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and if you have any questions at all, please feel free to send me a comadregram via email at comadrando at esc.network.com or slide up into my DMs. Um, <laughs> and thank you for spending time with your comadres and your doulas. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.